Good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are. How are you? Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Hi, Barbara. So good to see you. I'm very excited for our conversation. I and it is too. afternoon <laughs> for me. It's officially afternoon. It's 6 a.m., 6.30 a.m. here on the East Coast in New York. So I am 12.30 p.m. here in Berlin. Amazing. Um, hi, everybody. So I am Barbara Fosu-Samoa. I am a translator from Italian to English. I'm living in New York City, born in the born in Ghana, but raised in the Bronx, New York. And um, I really, I'm interested in and in driven to translation by thinking about how do we expand notions of diaspora, particularly the Black um, African diaspora through writings written by Black women in Italy. So kind of thinking through how do we conceptualize and expand notions of blackness, notions of womanhood, notions of femininity, um, notions of racialized identity and gendered um, behavior, particularly gendered racism um, through the literary text of black women. What about you, Kayama? Hey, so my name is Kayama Glover. I am the translator of uh, primarily Haitian fiction in French into English, but also um, Francophone, um, nonfiction as well into English. So many, many Haitian novels and then um, both a memoir and a sociological study uh, in French by Franco Reunionez and a Franco-African uh, women writer. And so, yeah, for me, um, you know, we had thought about this talk that what we would do is introduce ourselves. Also, by the way, to say a hearty and sincere thanks to the British Center for Literary Translation for bringing us together into this space yeah. and giving us the opportunity to be in conversation. Um, I'm a huge admirer of your work, Barbara, and so it's nice to be able to share the space with you, this virtual weird space with you. Um, but yeah, so just to say, um, we, had, we thought we'd start off by just introducing ourselves and saying how we came to translation and then really informally back and forth about some of our own motivations and personal principles and conundrums, if that's a word, um, et cetera, and, and, and ask each other questions about our work. Yeah. Um, for me, I am a professor of Francophone literature and culture at Barnard College, Columbia University in New York uh, in the US. And um, I write a lot about Francophone fiction, Haitian fiction in particular, and Caribbean fiction more broadly. And so I came to translation as um, a delicious um, other space for me to do some of the intellectual labor and thinking that I do when I'm confronting literature. So I had, um, you know, both selfish and altruistic motivations for doing this work selfishly. And I'm going to ask you about this later, Barbara, but I, yeah. I feel like translating enables me to get a lot closer to text and trying to understand, write about, and teach. Um, yeah. So it's this really obligatory slow down and savoring and understanding of literature through yeah. translation that helps me as a scholar and as a, and as a professor. Um, and then maybe a little bit more altruistically because I work on Haiti and because I work on Haitian literature, I am deeply motivated by a desire, especially in the US, for people to have access to Haitian stories that are different from the ones they read in the New York Times or that they see on the six o'clock news. Um, and so trying to kind of expand the community of readers of Haitian literature um, is important to me as well. Yeah, it's interesting. I feel like I came to translation similarly. Um, and I'm at a I'm at a very different point in my career because I'm starting grad school. I'm starting a PhD um, in Romance Languages and Literature. And I came to translation almost as a way to, well, one of the ways in which translation became really so almost like fundamental to my existence as a scholar in some ways was that as I was trying to sort of apply to programs and explain why Italy, why Black folk in Italy and kind of getting that pushback, well, yeah, you know, they're, why Italy? And and I try to explain and folks would be like, yeah, but we don't really have access to that information, right? Now. We're not thinking about Italy right now. Mm. Um, almost, and the silent part of that is like, it's not really relevant right now. I, like people, Black people in Italy are not necessarily who we care to, to engage with in this moment. Um, which is and, shocking. I which is shocking, say, given, particularly shocking, yeah. everything. Um, mm. And I have, I, 
came to Italy because my family had immigrated there and um, started learning Italian and a desire to really connect with family. And that became a very expanded sort of relationship with a, with a country that I studied abroad in when um, migrations and across the Mediterranean were at a particular high. And so navigating my own identity as a, a Black woman, yet African, but who held an American passport, um, and, and the ways in which I was able to move through certain spaces if I had that document in hand, and the ways in which I was not if I did not. Um, mm -hmm. And so for me, translation became a way of, of making these stories, these experiences particularly accessible um, to folks who would not have access to it otherwise, and mm -hmm. perhaps would not even consider to seek it out, right? And yeah. and also as a scholar, as a way to then have access to information that I potentially would need as I'm working, working through sort of my own academic and scholarly endeavors. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, it's this mix of often kind of engaging with a culture where, and particularly with Black folk in Italy, right? That same, you talk about this in your essay a little bit too, um, the US centric hegemony, right? Like everything mm -hmm. is viewed through the lens of an American experience. Um, and, and, and then really seeking to figure out and participate in creating language for um, an experience, a culture, a dynamic that doesn't necessarily have to be filtered through the United States. Right, absolutely. And I think, you know, I, I love that you said that I'm excited for you. I didn't realize you were gonna be headed to graduate school. Congratulations. Yeah. And I <laughs> think, you. you know, uns unsolicited uh, confirmation of what you suspect, it will be so helpful yeah. Um, to bring translation to bear on the work that you're doing in terms of understanding the context and the literature that you're working on. Yeah. Um, in one of the translations I, I did when I, I was writing in a translator's afterward, actually, and thinking about, you know, it was a particular translation that um, had not been con commissioned and had been something, the translation I write about in the essay had been quite a struggle yeah. to yeah. to get to press, basically, and realizing that it was so much inspired by the fact that, you know, I'm teaching in a university in New York City, which is you know, an expansive diasporic community, yep. a great and, and, and rich Haitian population throughout the city. Um, but the many of the students that I had who, um, who proudly identified as Haitian, but who had left Haiti a long time ago, or who only spoke Kyle in English at home, if they spoke Kyle, but certainly didn't necessarily speak French. Yeah. Um, just kind of thinking about the disconnect between what they did have access to in English about Haiti. <laughs> you know, this is the yeah. time of, you know, our former um, leaders comments about whole countries and the mm -hmm. like, but that this mm -hmm. is, these were the, the words in English they had ad access yeah. to for the, for the most yeah. part, but that there was this incredible patrimony that I was immersed in as a speaker of French um, that didn't have the same purchase in this yeah. diasporic community yeah. and feeling like these are the bridges that need to be built, built because yeah. the way that my Haitian American and Caribbean American students experienced even things as global, as you say, as the global movement for black lives, had much to do with the particular idiosyncratic realities of their cultural origins um, yeah. and their stories, right? Um, yeah. And so in that respect, tra translation um, is a tool that has an immense amount of emotion obviously packed into it and intention packed into it, but, but is very much a service that one hopes to do for oneself and for um, a larger community, I would say. Yeah, and I mean, in Italy too, it's an interesting kind of space because there are really spurred on, but not only kind of kind of triggered by the uprisings in 2020. Um, mm -hmm. Similarly, sort of this desire, this hunger really for language, right? How do we talk about anti-Black? Sure. How do we oh, talk gosh, about yes. racism? How do we talk about, you know, racialized oppression or, mm -hmm. you know, misogynoir, like all these words that, you know, are have come to the discourse on racialized identity and experience from mm -hmm. multiple languages, but are really rooted in you know, this idea of, well, look at those, the USians who are having this, like another protest and we support them over there, but that could never happen over here, right? And and, and the hunger by black folk in Italy who are saying, no, but it is happening here, right? Like right. we are talking about these same things. We are having these same discourses. We are writing mm -hmm. the narratives, the literature, the, the novels, the nonfiction, the essays, mm -hmm. whatever. We're having those same things, but we can't even begin to talk about racism because it doesn't, we, we don't even have the foundational language, right? To, to grasp on the threads 
to begin mm-hmm. having these um, these these meaningful conversations. Right. And so what's been happening, particularly in Italy, is a lot of translation of text by writers from English, all from um, from Portuguese, from French into Italian as a mm-hmm. way of sort of expanding that discourse. And then, but then it's also sort of like thinking about well, you're still bringing everything in. It's still very much an outward look to see what's happening elsewhere. What about the writers here, right? Mm -hmm. What are we doing? What are we talking about? Will there be space for us to also articulate our direct and distinct experiences, um, which add to, you know, the globalized discourse of Black lives, but also really are very specific to our lived, you know, reality of being in a country that has a colonial history that has been erased, right? Being in a country that, even though that colonial history has been erased, that history still really directly impacts the citizenship laws, like the educational pathways, the just basic everyday lives of, of mm-hmm. Black folk who are perpetually told, you are not from here, you cannot right. be from here, right? Um, and so, yeah, it's been interesting to kind of think about how these sort of different experiences, distinct, but also universal, um, mm-hmm. speak to each other. And I wanna, I wanna come back to what you said about um like the absence of, of words to have the conversations that need to be had in a local context, yeah. because, yeah. you know, and it's the same thing in France where literally race is a discounted category of uh, social identity um, because the individual is meant to subsume their ethnic and racial identity to the identity of, of being French, which is, you know, quiet as it kept, just white. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. But the point being that the borrowing from Black American Lex, a Black American lexicon of protest and solidarity yeah. is on the one hand like a great power move, right? It enables yeah. some of these conversations to happen in ways that immediately are connected to a wider Atlantic world, a wider diasporic world. Yeah. But at the same time, and this, you know, this is, I think, embedded in some of what you were saying as well, it also does a disservice to the local community because yeah. it allows to, it allows for the perpetuation of the idea that well, because there is no translation for these words, that itself is proof that these yeah. words have no purchase in our context, that this is a, cultu- a cultural import. And so as a translator, as a Black woman, as a person who thinks about these things, you find yourself in this kind of conundrum where you're thinking, well, you know, it, it is true, certainly, that um, we need translation to facilitate these kinds of conversations. Yeah. But at the same time, one can worry coming from the English speaking world about like imp- the imposition, like perpetuating mm-hmm. that kind of the same cultural imperialism that makes English a lingua franca, lingua franca more broadly. Like, am I doing that same thing as here I come from Afro-America to yeah. school you all or to translate yeah. things, you know what I mean? There's just a little bit of that tension, I'd say. It definitely plays out. Okay. I've, I've had a few sort of thor- thorny moments um, where I'm trying to translate perhaps a word that in Italian, um, because Italian similar to French is a gendered language, right? And so there, it's not a word for word right. sake, right? There's layers to everything that gets said. And so if mm-hmm. I'm translating something particularly, and I find myself often in the space with the different iterations of the n-word um, as, it, as it exists oh, yeah. in Italian language and do I how do I sort of mm. qualify it in English so that I the reader who may not have access to Italian or the original text can understand like the deep deep heaviness of that particular word in the context that it's being used in right so what does it yeah. mean as a when, a when a black woman writes about being called the equivalent of the n-word in Italy that really, it's not just, oh, you are this person. It means, you know, perhaps you're considered prostitute. Perhaps you're considered, you know, um, just like a bottom feeder. Right. Perhaps you're considered- So it's not bottom. like just semantic. It's also connotative it's in ways that are hard to translate into the Anglosphere exactly. for sure. Yeah, exactly. And how do you render that in a way that is accessible without like seeking palatability so that it erases like the heavy- The violence of, of it, yeah. The violence of it, right? Um, and at the same time, for me, particularly, and I'm curious uh, to hear from you too, a, a lot of the writers that I write are writing often from a place of deep pain, right? It's like, I need to write in order to survive, in order to process. Um, and so how do I, I often find myself in my personal sort of like ethic, how do I do this in a way that really helps the reader understand that there is a heaviness here, 
but there's also a lightness in the process mm -hmm. of writing. Um, freeing that yeah. comes, a self-liberation that comes from. Yeah. Can you say a little bit, I just, I wanna, maybe it would be worth, because you know, there's sure. a bunch of people out here that may or may not know our work, like what, who do yeah. you translate? If you could yeah, so, tell folks. So I'm working, I, I, I mostly translate a lot of um, young writers, black women writers. Uh, I, I work with a close translator, Candace Whitney, and we're currently working on, well, it's pretty much done, but uh, on a, an anthology of essays by black Italian women called Future, um, Futures translated into English. And it is an anthology of short stories by fiction, nonfiction, creative, um, Afrofuturism, et cetera, um, mm -hmm. of these women talking about their particular kind of experiences or dynamics mm -hmm. or relationships to Italy. And so one essay actually that I translated, um, pretty apropos for this conversation, is a woman, Marie Moise, who writes about her family immigrating from Haiti to Italy and mm -hmm. her not realizing for a wow. long time that she was Haitian um, because her family had passed for white, right? So it, part of their part of their actual physical movement from Haiti to Italy was to cut off the ties. Uh, of deracialize. Yeah. yeah, it was absolutely deracialized until, and she didn't realize this until really she was in middle school drawing her family tree and someone said, you should make your grandfather a little darker uh, because, and then that really opened up a whole world of like wow. her relationship and ties to blackness and, 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 and that break, right, both physical and mental that happens when you have to remove yourself and deracialize yourself from a culture and a history because survival requires that. Um, and so a lot of my translations are kind of really pulling apart these histories and these, um, these present lived experiences of what does it mean when a woman talks about working at a store counter in Milan and you know someone coming to her and saying, no, no, I wanna talk to a white store clerk because you don't know what you're talking about or okay. I don't even believe that you work here, right? Um, or another translation piece that I'm working on is a is an author, Angelica Fazzini. She's also a scholar who writes about um, the uh, orphanages in um, in East Africa that were created for the biracial children of fascist Italians. And mm -hmm. so that and so these were orphanages run by the Catholic Church, um, specifically for mixed race children, um, mm -hmm. in order to keep them out of Italy, ex specifically because they didn't want to, you know blacken the race get, getting the all that blackness all over everybody yeah <laughs> yeah exactly keep them over there mm -hmm. uh so that's some of the work that i'm that i i'm kind of always sitting with mm -hmm. um both contemporary historical and and always thinking about how do we how do i render this in a way that makes sense to someone who might not even have considered these histories these stories but also for different people have access to right you know the particularities of, of racialized um, diasporic experience. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, um, I realize that the, the translations that I tend to do, um, are, are, I've come recently, I've started doing more contemporary translations or more, more contemporary writing some short, short stories. Mm. Um, but that my, my wheelhouse and focus has been very tethered to, um, like the work I do as a scholar. And so it's a lot of early and mid, mid yeah, early and mid 20th century Haitian writers, um, or even those pieces that are more contemporary, it's writers who have a certain generation. Um, yeah. And and I think, you know, if I think about like the biggest picture of why that might be, it's it's largely because as a scholar, I'm anchored in a, in a French department um, from which I've always felt a little bit like, you know, I was going to say the black sheep of the family, but that's a little too on the nose. <laughs> uh, so I'll say a little bit, you know, um, minoritized or marginalized within that context. And so I've done a lot of community building as a scholar into Africana studies departments, but yeah. that tend to be dominated by Anglophone. Uh, mm -hmm. So like kind of an ultimate, like a, a between two families situation. And so I think my concession to feeling perhaps more at home in Africana studies in a way has been to want the novels that I teach to French students to be accessible to them in English. Mm -hmm. So it's been so um, almost psychologically about there is a canon here. These are big, great works from Haiti that you all need to read. Oh, we yeah. can't read them and they're in French. Well, guess what? They're in English, so you can read yeah. them. <laughs> so um, there's, a, there's definitely a, a motivation there that's that's preachy, arguably, maybe a little political, yeah. but 
but it's it's where I'm at when I'm doing the work. Um, but I think it does in some ways when you describe the project that you're working on now. I uh, I don't know if you feel this way ever, but it's just like there's so much you want to be translating, right? Like there's yeah. there's only so much time, and I would love to be translating new authors, authors just yeah. starting out. But but when and you know and and I will say this, and again, this is unsolicited unsolicited confirmation or counsel, but as you go into graduate school, you'll realize, right, that you have sometimes to make the choice between what's going to count as mm -hmm. being productive and, and following the directives of your program and what is going to be seen as, well, that's just a thing that she likes to do, right? And kind of yeah. figuring out the balance there. Yeah. Yeah. And I think like, it, so I actually applied to grad school three times and got in on the third try. And it was that in-between space, right? Trying to figure yeah. out where my home was when I felt like I belonged in multiple homes at the same time. And so part of it, my computer is behave, misbehaving, so I hope it doesn't oh. leave us alone. Um, but part of it was applying to Africana Studies programs and kind of mostly Anglophone, mostly Caribbeanist and saying, you know, Europe, Italy, and that question of but why kind of coming up mm -hmm. and then applying to other, and I was actually quite resistant to Italian programs uh, because I didn't want, I was like, oh, I don't want to be an Italianist. Like not because I'm not researching Italy, but I didn't want to get stuck. It, feel, it felt like I might get stuck, right? Um, in a very specific home that I wasn't necessarily super driven to be in. Um, I, I hear you. <laughs> and in my so, bones. <laughs> yeah. And so it took me a long time to say, okay, Barbara, like you have to do this. You have to, if you want to do this work and you want to pursue academia to some degree, do the romance languages and literature. Start mm -hmm. there and create a home for yourself, like create a pathway for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and translation became sort of that modality to create that pathway, um, very much so. And mm -hmm. so it, it, it has, I appreciate that. And I'm sure, and I hope we'll have more conversations uh, to come as, as I really kind of dig into this because I think part of it too, right, is thinking about the fact that, you know, for me, there actually aren't that many texts to translate because there aren't that many, the Italian black publishing, Italian. Yeah, yeah, Black Italian, it's a very specific, what feels like very niche space. Okay. Um, and to be frank, the Italian publishing world has not been so open to it, right? Like there has been, there's the one, there's the two, and and even mm, that, okay. like the person is referred to as, you know, the, the Italian Toni Morrison. It's like, no, no, she's the Italian person. Um, right. And so, you wow. know, the Italian Maria Moise, or the Italian Giada Shego, the Italian um, Angelica Pazzarini, whatever. But mm. it's often sort of like, where is the mirror for this person in an Anglophone world mm -hmm. so we can sell this product, right? Um, sure. And so, Luckily, most of the authors that I work with, all the authors that I work with are still living. And so a lot of my translation is I translate a thing, I reach out to them and say, hey, um, and part of my ethic is I wanna make sure that I'm rendering this in a way that makes sense to you. If you mm -hmm. speak English, please read it. If you don't, let's talk about it. But I don't wanna be creating text or making up something um, that doesn't resonate, right? With, with mm -hmm. what you are hoping to render. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. Really yeah. So I think that um, our conversation was titled Race and Responsibility in Translation. Yes, Race and Responsibility in Translation. So um, mindful of time, I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about um, that. And yeah, of course. if there's more like that you might want to say, I mean, we, you know, we talked about a few things that concern us mutually, particularly around um, let's call it, let's say, translation, silence, and, and, and violence, and mm -hmm. even silence as imbricated in violence necessarily, um, and translation <laughs> for that matter, mm -hmm. also potentially becoming um, a violent practice if enacted without a sense of responsibility. Um, both of our contributions to this anthology more or less directly turn around that, like what is the responsibility yeah. in particular of the, um, the black translator with respect to certain texts. You know, mm -hmm. What do we feel to be? Are, are there standards of ethics? Are there only one-to-one -one cases? So yeah, if there's anything, I don't know if you want to dig in. Yeah. So my my essay, which is really more an interview, I'm gonna switch. My computer's gonna give up on me. Okay, yeah, go for it. If I don't. Okay. So 
sorry. Okay, there we go. Um, hopefully that's better. My translation is an inter I'm sorry, my essay is an interview with the author Emma Beze Phillip, who is a um, who is a writer, Canadian uh, Trinidadian writer, um, who who has a book, a book length poem called Zong that was translated into Italian without her permission. And therein begins an unfurling of a lot of things. And, and in that the translator and the publishing house and the English publishing, the American publishing house and the Italian publishing house and the publicists and everybody um, really went through a process of translating this text without her permit, without really asking her permission for it, um, without listening to her, you know, pushed back when she said, this is not what I asked for, this is not what I wanted. And, and often framing her, the translation as, as a favor, almost like, aren't you so glad that this text is now available, right, in Italian for you? And it was an interview that took a long time for us to complete because of the trauma of the particular experience, right? Um, and so when I think about, you know, the violences and the silences <laughs> um, as it relates to translation sometimes, a question that came up with Narbezi, but that comes up with myself a lot is when do we, how do we as translators really make sure that we are honoring our writer make sure they're right or honoring the context from which the particular text is coming from and the context to which the particular text is going to um, and, and sort of really creating a home right we are we are the bridge right between New York and New Jersey we're the George Washington Bridge um, to make these two places speak to each other and and there's a, a very particular and important um, ethic that has to go into it Regardless, and it does, it can't just be, well, I understand these two languages, the end, right? Um, there's a work, I believe, that a, a translator must do. And it doesn't, it's not because I'm Black, the writer's Black, or um, I'm from this place, the writer's from this place, the end. It's, am I understanding what this text is about? I'm, am I going to take the responsibility, right, to make sure that this text, wherever it lands, lands in the way that I can, I can, I can speak for it, right? And I can mm -hmm. speak on behalf of it. And I can speak if my author is alive, the author and I are in conversation. If the author is not, what are the responsibilities otherwise? And so, mm -hmm. yeah, there's just something that that just hit me because of the if my author is alive part because that's really so yeah. So in in this, the case of Nervezi Phillips gaslighting by essentially the complicit coloniality of her publisher and of the publisher and translator in Italy with the complicity of her English press, right? That essentially, if, from what I understood, just sold the rights sold the to book. the translation, sold the rights. Mm -hmm. which, you know, so that's kind of like the first layer, I, you know, I tend, how can I say, so as translators, we are often you know full well, you translate a thing and you go back to it the next week. It's already published, you go back to the next week. You're like, oh, that I should have, I wish I had done it differently. Should have done right? differently. Yeah. And not to mention the 10 other translators who could say, oh, I wouldn't have done that. Right, so okay. Yeah. So there's the individual translator that that bears a certain amount of responsibility, but it that that is an artist in their yeah. own right. And yeah. we can come to that in a second. But there's the top layer is the, in, the literary institution, right? So the publishers, the people who have the money, the people who are signing the contracts and determining how much value to give to the writer yeah. and to the book, like really how yeah. much value and how much, and because they're the ones that ultimately determine who they're going to allow to translate the book, right? So, so there's, and how much that person is going to get paid, how much direction that person will or will not have to take. So I think it's really important for us as translators to recognize the colonial structures of yeah. the institutions that facilitate yeah. translation in addition to holding individuals accountable, for sure. But we as individuals, I mean, I know I got very fortunate, for example, and I mentioned this in my essay with the, um, the choice of Akashic on the cover of my mm -hmm. book, but it's a book mm -hmm. that has Vodou in it. I could have gotten something really atrocious and lamentable. Yeah. And nowhere in my contract does that say that I have right of refusal for a cover, yeah. for example. 
right? So yeah. we, we do know that there are bigger structures than ourselves as individual yeah. translators that determine the way that race travels and is understood across yeah. cultures and languages, and that's out of our hands. Um, yeah. But then, of course, the individual translator, what struck me in, in the question of whether or not the author is alive or dead, um, you know, it seems to me that it should be that if all authors were dead, <laughs> translators would still be accountable to them in the right kinds of ways, right? Absolutely. Like, Absolutely. Bonus if you can chat with your author. But if you can't, like, who are you as the individual who elects to take on this process and this project of shepherding this text into the world yeah. on behalf of another person. Yeah. What are you bringing to the table besides your knowledge of the second language? Yeah, um, and it's been interesting. I, last, was it last year or the year before? I've gotten the question a lot, like who gets to translate? And yeah, everyone, uh, does. <laughs> everyone does. And, right. you know, it was a piping hot, great question for a hot second. And I, I think mm -hmm. folks have sort of moved on. But I remember I had, I just, because I entered translation very much from a place of like, I feel like I came in like a wrecking ball a little bit. I was like, I need to get these translated because there's so yeah. much going on that people are not talking about, thinking about seeing. And, and then it was like, well, you know, who gets to translate? And I was like, we're, it's not about that, right? Like, what is, what are, what is your praxis? Like, how are you engaging with this text? What are, you know, people, I find that for me and for you as well, and for a lot of people, translation is inherently political always. Mm -hmm. um, and for some folks, it's like, well, you know, I have, I speak English, I speak French yeah. or Spanish or whatever. I have some time or I don't, whatever the case may be. And this is not an intention to minimize or belittle or really undermine folks who translate book for love of language. It's not, it's, mm -hmm. it's more like an encouragement to think about as you are translating what is your anchor? Like, why mm -hmm. are you doing this? Um, and, and I think the why, no matter what it is, is incredibly important to really anchor the process and like the, what, what comes out, right, when you're done. Um, I really love listening to translators of all languages talk about, you know, why they translate and how they translate, for whom they translate. Mm -hmm. um, the answers to those questions often really help you understand like it helps you even love the text even more because mm -hmm. there's substance there right um and that's really important for me as a young newish uh translator and i think that's also about disabusing ourselves and readers of the notion that translation is some sort of you know like human embodiment of google translate that oh I yeah it's in french and now i give it yeah. to you in english and we're done but yeah but understanding that if there is a person between the source text and the and the and the target text, let's say, um, it's because you need the human there. Like you need what yeah. the human can offer in yeah. terms of context, in terms of understanding, yeah. in terms of yeah. intimacies that are developed from engagements with the culture, right? Yeah. And understanding of, of cultural context, etc. Um, and so it really bothers me when 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 called to account regarding translation to translator just as well you know this was a project and I and I didn't do much to yeah. inform myself that as if somehow yeah. they can't be blamed because they didn't try when yeah. not trying seems to be the issue um, and not also like the importance of trying translation is so hard you know like it's not just like you sit down and you're just like okay here's the the in the language is this it's like I mean at least for me and imagine for many people, it's such a, it has from, it's such a process of like holding and beholding, right? Like, I, mm -hmm. I, like here is this text, whether I chose it for myself or I'm on the contract to work mm -hmm. on it, that I'm spending a lot of intimate time with for a long time, right? Whatever, whatever, however you came to it, you came to it. And, and mm -hmm. I think like, why not really like seek to understand the work and why not like build some sort of I don't know I I'm like but let's take it not rhetorically <laughs> let's say yeah, I mean, not, yeah. why not right so why in the not? case of your you know the article the interview the circumstances around um the mistranslation slash distranslation of Zong 
Um, and I have a question for you about that prefix because I'm really curious about, I liked the dis. Um, but in, in that, the why not, right? So why, like what's in it for a translator that doesn't translate, um, yeah, I'm just gonna go say it like, ethically, <laughs> right? That yeah. doesn't um, translate mindfully. Um, you know, I feel that it's important to say that that that's not just a um, neglect. It is a practice. It is a violent practice. It mm -hmm. is a practice of coloniality. It is a reminder mm -hmm. of which voices matter and how much. And I think, yeah. you know, like why not isn't rhetorical. There are answers to why not. The why not yeah. is ultimately, in the case of Nebezi Phillips, the author didn't matter. This Black woman writer did not matter to the desires of that Italian press. And yeah. the fact of not even being willing to engage honestly um, yeah. and to switch from what she was calling out, which was the fact of being gaslight, the fact of being silenced and, and not consulted, to switch from there to all translators' lives matter. Like, do you yeah. have a problem with her being white? Yeah. And, and, and using that facile pivot to discredit her legitimate um, complaint is, is really frustrating and it's intentional. And it's very intense. And it's a, not accidental. And it's not, and it's not only in the world of literature, right? Like it's a microcosm of of all the things, right? All the ways in which we're perpetually, at, and I can speak to this myself, um, mm -hmm. as a black woman, uh, immigrant, all these different sort of layers on top of each other. Whenever any sort of violent, big or violence, big or small, is perpetuated towards or against you, and you say, "Hey, that hurt," it's like, right. "Well, you know, I didn't mean that," or well, you know, like other people experience it too, or well, you know, like whatever, right? The it's stakes well are too know. high for that. The stakes are too yeah. high. Like, mm -hmm. why are you being so sensitive? Right. And, mm -hmm. and, and like the perpetual silencing, like the literal, like, I cannot speak any longer because every time I open my mouth, I'm told to shut up. Mm -hmm. um, and I think when I was speaking to Noveze, that was really the resonance of that, right? To, to speak with someone who, for me, is such a huge, you know, part of my literary let's con to mm. say like, even to me, this has happened, right? Mm. Um, yeah, it, it, it's stunning in ways that I'm sure, and I, I, you know, we're here because of the British Center of Literary Translation uh, Summer School for all of you who are on the call, who are translators, who are aspiring translators to really think about what are your ethics? What is your mm. political motivation for translation? Um, what work are you doing in order to render work, not just from a language to another, but really to engage with cultures and communities? Mm -hmm. um, what are the states, right, um, that you are you are working with? And that is something I think it was implicit in the response to to Philip certainly, um, but I think applies to those of us doing the kind of labor that translation is, which just to be frank, very frank is often not particularly well remunerated. It, not necessarily first yeah. considered in, in certain engagements, but to still really avoid assuming a posture of supplication. Like, no, like, I think there is a conditioning, particularly we can say of marginalized people more broadly, but Black women writers, Black women translators as well. And this goes back to, again, to Phillips, the response to Phillips. You, sh you are lucky that you got this far, right? That's kind of the, the umbrella atmosphere into which you step. So don't mess this up. Don't mess this up by disagreeing. Don't mess this up by insisting on something that ultimately you don't have the right to determine. Um, so as, you, and again, like addressing all of you here, as you do, as Barbara said, embark on translation and translation practice, you just kind of need to have that core as to what are the parameters of what you're willing to accept and how does that relate to why you started translating in the first place. Um, but it's not easy because the presumption is supplication. The presumption is that you need and we have the power to grant you that need or grant you the thing you need or not. Um, and so it's difficult to stand firm in that and not be compromised by the limitations that are imposed from outside when you're doing the practice of, of translation, I think. Yeah. I'm, I'm noticing it's it's 10 past almost. Do we it have is. a little space for people to, to chime in or ask Yeah, questions? of course. I'm gonna, so I'm having some computer issues. If I pop, if I get bumped out, I'm gonna jump in on my phone. 
So okay. just in case we'll understand. I disappear for a second, I'll be back, I promise. That's good. But we yeah, are, the Q&A, the, the Q&A is open and the chat has been popping. So I see a question for you from Anton. Uh, um, perhaps a statement. Okay. I'm Dr. Glover, I'm a huge fan. I, okay. I'm, I know you've written about this, but I was wondering if you could tell us about the issues you're discussing in a specific case, like the behind the scenes happenings for Hadriana and All My Dreams. Hi, Barbara. He also Hi, Hi Barbara. Also <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Hi, Anton. <laughs> um, so yeah, that was, that was a, a uh, something about, it was a rather rough <laughs> i just said to avoid the attitude of supplication but i was very much in a position of supplication <laughs> when it came to this um yeah. to this book um it's a book that was not commissioned it was a, a book by haitian author Rene de best um will be 96 next month uh, still writing um and who i had worked on this book for my own research and thought that it was just a marvel that needed to be out in the anglosphere because of the um the space it created for thinking about voodoo in particular and zombification uh, as well um, in different ways. And as I said earlier in this talk, just my overall concern always with representations of Haiti as this savage, dark, cannibalistic, all the things that we hear far too often um, and feeling like this was an opportunity to share uh, a counter narrative of, of that. And so to me, that made perfect sense that I, you know, went to publisher number one, confident that no problem was a problem. Publisher number two, same thing. It's a, down to a, um, I'm, I'm summarizing here, but down to a fifth publisher who, with the help of Edwidge Dantica, as sort of a, um, an additional translator in a, in a way, not as a translator of the text, but a translator of my intention almost, and of the value of this author to these publishers, oh, Barb is gone, but she'll be back, um, became crucial. And this was largely because of the, well, two things. One, um, the general unwillingness to um, publication literature in, in translation, but also the nervousness of certain presses regarding, well, this is a text about, about voodoo or voodoo as we should understand it um, and feeling nervous about um, something they didn't understand and feared um, almost kind of getting in trouble. <laughs> I guess I would say, for presenting uncontextualized um, as a translation. And so it was, but it was something that um, was the challenge almost for me and made me want to make it happen even more, which was knowing that it was possible without rewriting or amending or dumbing down De Pesto's original text to communicate in English the richness of Haitian Vodou as a spiritual practice, a set of spiritual pra practices, as um, culture resonant and rich as Christianity, Islam, Judaism, or any number of other religions that similarly involve magical thinking and, um, and prediction and games with history, and yet are considered as being in some sort of other category to Haitian spirituality. So it became a real mission for me. And also, as I said, a challenge and an, an opportunity. That, that's what it felt like. While we wait for Barbara, I can maybe also just say that some of the things that we've talked about are also present in the essays that we contributed to the anthology. So there, I think Anton's referring to this, I, I really think hard and out loud about um, the challenges to translating the idiosyncratic idiosyncratic blackness of Haiti into the Anglophone context. And that having a lot to do with um, the way that Haitian writers write about the erotic, write about sexuality and write about women, um, particularly Haitian writers of the mid 20th and early, early late 20th century and how um, kind of getting over myself or feeling more confident and, and abandoning the attitude of supplication and trying to get this text published was so much reliant on conversations that I ended up having with my students to whom I taught the text and the different kinds of students to whom I taught the, te taught the text, meaning everything from elite graduate students at Columbia and NYU to undergraduates at community colleges in the New York area. And seeing their response to um, what Juanita Pest was writing made me realize that I needed to think about who I wanted to translate this book for. And then it didn't have to be a book for everyone in order to be a book worthy of being entered into the atmosphere. And that was kind of a eureka moment for me um, in working with this author and working with this text. 
Um, there's a bunch of questions now in the chat. Let's see. I'm just going to read them out loud. Thank you for setting this up. It's been eye-opening. As a student of translation, I'm currently translating a play about a Black Colombian community, Shamba. Shambaku into English, what would you say are some key things I should consider to avoid making a translation that's ignorant to the richness of the source text, especially because a lot of the characters use slang common in Black Spanish communities? Um, thank you for that question, Sonia. It's such an incredibly important one um, because what you're bringing up here is obviously the vernacular and the extent to which like this is the absolute proof of just knowing a second language doesn't qualify you for being able to render a text into uh, from that language into English. And, you know, I'll start by saying the very fact that you asked the question is a clear sign that you're not going to do that kind of mindless or ethically dubious translation that Barbara and I were talking about earlier, because you have front of mind um, your obligation to the text. Barbara, I'm just um, responding to Sanyu Kinuli in the Q&A, who's about to embark on a translation of a Black community, Colombian community's play into English. And um, Sanyu asks about how to avoid uh, missing out, missing some of the richness of the source text, given um, the use of the vernacular and of slang in the text. Um, and one uh, answer, and I'd love to hear yours as well, but an answer that I would give um, because this face, I face this obviously quite a lot in dealing with the Haitian French, which is heavily infused by Creole, um, if not actual words in Creole, then rhythms in Creole, syntax in Creole, is um, personally, I, I like to ask a native speaker of that community to read um, my, to read with me, I'll put it that way. I've asked people to read with me particular elements that I um, either need help with or to simply look at the text and tell me, you know, what makes them laugh in particular or where is the text winking at them in a way that it wouldn't necessarily wink at me as a non-native um, Haitian Creole or French speaker. That to me is, is gold. And I have like two or three people who are my people um, who, yeah, who, who are a part of that process for me. Yeah. I, I agree 100%. Thank you all for your patience. I had to run for a new computer. Uh, the Actually, the text I spoke about with Marie earlier, um, who wrote about her family being Haitian, um, that was a similar moment where I had, a, I had to have someone read. There was a point in it where she mentions a shell. And I translated it as a shell, obviously, because it made sense. And then I, I shared it with um, a Creole speak, um, a, Haitian, a Haitian friend of mine who said, no, no, you want to say concierge. Like, that's what they're trying to call it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's one of those sort of things where it requires, I would I wouldn't have translated it as a shell because I did not have that context. And I would never have sort of arrived there. But sharing mm -hmm. with somebody who understood the context, understood the language, um, said, you know, this is, if you're trying to render this for within a context of, of Haiti, conch is the word. Um, right. and, and, and so, yes, exactly. I also have multiple readers who um, are first readers, second readers, read my notes on the side where I'm saying, oh gosh, I have no idea what's going on here. Please help me untangle. And then folks where I'm saying, I'm done. I feel really good about this. Please let me know if you don't. <laughs> so I can go back to the drawing board. Um, it's translation is inherently also a community activity. Um, mm. It can be lonely, can be isolating, but it doesn't have to be alone, um, right. which is an important part, uh, which has felt always for me that it's always in partnership, in relationship, in conversation mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. with other people. Okay, I hope that helps um, answer your question. Um, Imogen Harad asks, is it meant, I translated academic rather than literary text, but perhaps you could talk about this, how do you deal with sensitive or loaded terms that have very different connotations in the original and the target languages? I sometimes struggle in a sort of gray area between complicity and censorship, if that makes sense. Um, you know, it's funny because I, I struggle with that more so in, in fiction works than I do in academic texts, Imogen. I, I actually feel, um, more unburdened when I'm translating academic texts because I feel more obliged to be faithful to the, um, to the source text. Not that I don't feel obliged to be faithful to the source text in fiction, but I understand that fiction ain't as much as 
it isn't about nuance and connotation. There's a more playful relationship. But if I'm tra tracing uh, Francoise Vergès's um, The Wombs of Women, Racism, Capitalism, and gender? Power no, feminism. Racism, capitalism, and feminism. She knows exactly what she wanted to say with each of these sociological terms. Um, and I feel very obliged to, to render her expertise as her own um, with as minimal um, mediation from me as, as possible. So I'm really not tempted to, to censor and I don't feel complicit because if I felt like there was something that bothered me in a nonfiction text about racism, feminism and capitalism, I wouldn't translate it. I'm gonna translate um, it to begin with, yeah. You know what I mean? And that's very different. And this might be, I don't know if I'm ignorant in saying this, but it's very different to me from fiction, which already, I have a lot of trouble with some of the books that I love to read that are in fiction. Like that's almost why I read them is to be in conversation with them in ways that can feel uncomfortable. And so that bleeds into the translating of those works as well. Um, so I'm, I'm not answering your question because I think I have a very, because I, I feel differently in some ways about, um, that divide between the academic and the literary. And I'd agree. I actually started out as a, a more of an academic translator. When I was living in Italy, I'd work with different um, Italian faculty to translate their texts from Italian to English, mostly for conferences. And I, I think it really helped train me as a translator because I was less beholden to creativity, right? Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't trying to, you know, wax poetic about whatever context or text was being written. Um, I just had to render like a sociological, psychological, whatever into the mirror kind of idea or, mm -hmm. or cor correlative text in English. And, um, but, but actually as what you're talking about is I struggle a lot translating poetry. I've, I've translated a few, um, yeah. but it's very hard bless you. for yeah. <laughs> bless the poets and the poetry translators because mm -hmm. y'all are doing the work because mm -hmm. it just similar to you struggling with with fiction in some ways poetry really requires you to unbend in in ways that are you know or like you can't even imagine or I can't even imagine to begin with and I'm constantly kind of like well it could be this or it could be this and if um one of the really cool projects that I got to do last year was a translation slam with a poet uh, mm -hmm. with poetry with three, two other translators and we all rendered the poem so differently in English because our relationship to it was so different our Absolutely. the way we heard the poem was very different right and so we kind of made choices and those choices could just not be made in the same way with an academic text because it's very you know in some ways quite rigid um structured uh that requires you just to like follow the right. road um, I'm, good, I'm headed back to the Q&A here. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Georgie, for your thanks. Um, can we speak about our experience in modern languages departments, which I found can be quite isolate, isolated even from other languages? Yes. And your work on translation and political thinking. How can we navigate these institutions responsibly without being subsumed by the gatekeeping logic of academia? I say this as someone about to start a PhD. I feel like this is you because I'm also about to start Gertie, so oh, I don't Lord. know. I don't want to say sad things. <laughs> um, <laughs> you find, friends. find your cohort. Yeah. You find your cohort and your community. And by that, not just like your buddies and your friends that will travel with you through programs, but you find the professors that get what it is that you want to do. And no matter what department they, they're in, you cultivate them as your crew. Um, and I do wish I had known that because I these words resonate profoundly with me. Um, the, isolating experience of modern languages departments. And I mentioned that earlier, just what it's been to be in a French department needing to reach into Africana studies to find some sort of home, um, but that being a compromise as well. Um, so yeah, I, I would say be attentive and intentional about um, who you work with, who you're writing and working in translation, translation groups are, right? So invest in your department, certainly, and this is going to sound cynical, and but I'm saying it because it's true. Invest in your department because you don't want anyone in that department to ever be in a position to say you're not a team player or you're not part of the department. I have had that happen to me, I and mean, it's it, it's hard to be a part of a team on which you don't feel welcome all the time. But nonetheless, that is our self responsibility to ourselves as we move through professionalization. So invest in your department, um, but um, also invest in creating, as I said, a cohort, a community, a scholarly community beyond that space 
that links into that space that will have your back, that will lead your work, that will get what you're trying to do. Um, and so, yeah, so that's for you to go from. Yeah, and yeah. Find, find a mentor, find, find a mentor, talk to, talk to Barbara, talk to me, like find your people, yeah. find your people. Because the academia is isolating, this video period. Over and taking yeah. copious notes. There you go. Um, Anita says, thank you so much for this talk and your work. I'm working on my PhD that looks at translating Blackness practices in Jamaican literature into French. What are your thoughts on translating Blackness framework and or translating Blackness guidelines? Hmm. Oh, there's a little question for us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, one of the things I wish I had done sooner, but now I can't, I think about all the time, um, is, 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 is do a deep dive into how blackness can be trans. Like what is blackness? Like what's black? How do people in your source yeah. context think about blackness and not like, yes, the word, because there isn't really a word, for example, for blackness in the French language that fits what it is in, in, in English. So like, how do you, how do you say black? Do you say negro or negro or something else? Do you say, find out all the ways to be black and to say black and to think black in yeah. source language context. I think that's, that's your framework. Like the, the, the source language and the culture it represents will tell you your framework for translating its blackness in quote, because it's not gonna, it can't possibly be the same um, as anywhere else, right? It's going to be unique to that context. You owe it to yourself and to your text to know as much as you can about what that context is, historically and contemporarily and linguistically. Yeah, and I, I love when often, I feel like on Twitter, translators would be like, I started translating a sentence and I spent eight hours looking for how to, you know, kill a mole or whatever. Um, it often, you have, looking for that text means doing the work of researching maybe it's watching a movie maybe it's listening to a podcast maybe it's reading the newspaper but there's so much i can even though for myself example even though i've lived in italy multiple times when i'm translating from my bedroom in yonkers new york there are things that i still have to remind like i need to remind myself and embed myself in that context right um and it's important if you, you have to embed yourself in, in the main, big and small ways in order to be able to render it in, in that way. Mm -hmm. um, that makes it helpful for you. I feel like I just that's fumbled funny. a little bit, but. No, not at all. I bet actually, so I think that's a great answer. I especially, and I will remember to say this to, to students and, and colleagues, but you're absolutely right. The importance of taking the time to think, to like listen to local media, right? To, to, where else do you get the most dynamic and up-to-date renderings of a culture than in its daily expressions through podcasts and radio shows and TV and all this? That's where the language lives. I can leave France for three months and miss out on a whole way of saying a thing that I, you know, that I wouldn't have known if, if I if I hadn't been there. Or even like the fact of being old, <laughs> like I, you know, what I mean? like the difference between what my ten-year-old knows of language and what I know of language is vast and so if I've got a book that needs that generationally doesn't match up with me then I owe it to myself as a translator and I owe it to the book to also look in those directions um so yeah it's research 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 and, and if you see the the text that I contributed to the anthology I tried to keep calm about it but one of the things that bothered me the most about this particular instance of mistranslation was the translator's saying, well, I hadn't really done any research before I did this translation. I was like, <laughs> how, that they did the, not only the fact of that, but the fact of being comfortable admitting that to me spoke volumes about, it was a Haitian text in particular, about the publishers and the translators, but the publishers also total disregard for the importance of rendering context in a world where Haiti is so disparaged that the translator could say, I actually didn't know anything about Haiti when I did this. I was like, wait, what? And then immediately to the trans, the publisher couldn't find someone who did know a couple of things about Haiti. Anyway. Yeah. Can I ask, that again. kind of puts a question of, you know, we talked about this and we've sort of scattered the, the, the responsibility of institutions, right? Mm -hmm. And the ways that, yes, the translator, has a huge responsibility in the politic, but the institutions too, particularly if, if a publishing house is the one who is commissioning the work, for example. Um, and if I were a publisher right now, I'm saying, but I wanna do this better. I wanna be better. Mm -hmm. what, what piece of advice would you give a publisher? 
to, to just like be less violent. Racist, colonial, I don't know. <laughs> colonial, violent, like all the, all the stacks all the of things. violences. What would I, uh, I would tell, I would suggest to publishers that they approach trans, like in looking for their translators, they approach organizations like Alta, for example, that they, that they inform themselves, that they don't treat it like the poor stepchild of their bigger picture interests. And there are many publishers, by the way, like that are translation focused who absolutely do this kind of work. So, you know, mo many, if not all of the small translation presses, I would say do that. But it's more like the random houses and the big presses that tend to, yeah, it's fine. It's fine. So I don't have a lot to say to them because I feel like they know what they should. It's not rocket yeah. science to, yeah. to, to first acknowledge the context of the source tech, like what, what country is this coming from and how is that country situated in geopolitical power structures right now? Like what is my, like we've chosen this text from this place. What is this place? And then like take a few minutes to do a little homework about who the right person for the job would be and get out of your head if you even thought it would be acceptable to say, oh, that person speaks French, let me have them translate that test. Yeah. Unacceptable, do more, you know, I don't do know. More. And do then more, it, it do better. Do better, <laughs> and then it doesn't create this like, back to sort of that that horrible Amanda Gorman situation where it felt like folks were like, I have to eat, so whatever the mm -hmm. case may be, if I'm eating, then you can't eat. If you're eating, then I can't eat. It's like, no, we can, yeah, we there's so there, much yeah. literature. There are so many texts. There are so many points of entry in the world that we can access. Um, mm -hmm. And often publishers, right, are perpetuators of the coloniality in which they 100%. pit us against each other. Um, and it doesn't have to be that way. We are at time. This yeah. has been the most delightful 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. conversation <laughs> in a very long time, <laughs> despite my computer conking out. <laughs> you did great. Um, you rallied. Thank you so much for being just so amazing. And I'm so glad. Thank I feel like much. I got like I got to sit in the corner and just like listen to you be awesome. <laughs> and vice versa. And I'm excited for more conversations, not necessarily televised, but between us yes. going forward. And that is sincere. But our paths keep crossing and I hope they will continue to do so. I hope so and too. I hope so thanks too. Everyone who's been here and for BCLT for inviting us. This is yes. This is a, this and is for all of you in summer school, have a lovely rest of your week. Thank you mm -hmm. so much. Take care, everyone. <laughs>